Here is nothing. Here is nothing in curly braces, also called the empty set, but let's give it a better name, zero. Here is zero in curly braces, let's call that one. Two is zero and one in curly braces, and for any number, we can take it and all the numbers it contains and put them in curly braces. This is called the successor of two. Because every number is either zero or the successor of some other number, we can get rid of the curly braces entirely and instead write three as s of s of s of zero. Here's all of these in curly braces. Uh, trust me, they're all there to the right. This is the set of natural numbers. What can we do with them? Here's a function. It takes two natural numbers, a and b, and outputs, well, if b is 0, then it just outputs a, and if b is the successor of some number c, then it outputs the successor of f of a and c. An example could do, consider f of 3 and 2. 2 is s of 1, which means that this is s of f of 3 and 1 by our definition, and 1 is s of 0, so this is s of s of f of 3 and 0, which according to our definition is just 3. s of s of 3 is s of 4, and finally s of 4 is 5. Our mystery function takes the successor of a exactly b times it adds b to a. f is just addition. And if you're a nerd, you can use induction to prove that it has all the properties you already know it does, such as 0 doing what 0 does, and associativity and commutativity. Also, here's multiplication. It works analogously, and it applies the plus b function a times, in other words, a times b. And with even more induction, you could prove that it also has the properties it obviously has, but you're not a nerd, are you? Anyway, so we can add and multiply natural numbers, but we cannot always subtract them. And in order to save ourselves from this predicament, I'm going to introduce a trick, which at first is going to seem way too convoluted for what it actually accomplishes, but please bear with me. Consider pairs A, B of natural numbers. Let two such pairs be equivalent according to a relation tilde Z, if a plus d equals b plus c. For example, a pair c d being equivalent to 2 0 means 2 plus d equals 0 plus c, or c equals d plus 2, so 3 1, 4 2, 9 7, etc. are all equivalent to 2 0. More generally, if we list all these pairs in a grid like this, it's easy to see that all of the ones equivalent to 2 0 lie on this violet diagonal, the ones equivalent to 0 0 lie on this red one, and if I color all the diagonals, it's easy to see that any two elements in the same diagonal are equivalent to each other. These sets of objects which are all equivalent to each other are in general referred to as equivalence classes. For a pair AB, we can define its negative as just the pair BA, and it's easy to check that if AB is equivalent to CD, then so are their negatives. We can also define the sum of two pairs as A plus C, B plus D. Back on our grid, the negative of 2, 0 is 0, 2, the negative of 7, 5 is 5, 7, and as we've just seen, the negative of anything on this violet diagonal will lie on this yellow diagonal. You can also check that anything on this green diagonal plus anything on this violet diagonal will lie on this orange diagonal. This means that, crucially, we can stop thinking about the pairs themselves and start doing arithmetic with just the diagonal. We say that the green diagonal plus the violet diagonal is the orange diagonal. We define the integers to be equivalence classes of pairs of natural numbers with respect to our relation tilde z. This is also called the quotient by tilde z and is written like this. nxn is just the set of pairs of natural numbers. Also here is multiplication in integers, just trust me, it, it works out nicely. In order to talk about the integers though, we need to give them names and they're exactly what you'd expect. This red diagonal is called 0, this purple one is called 1, and so on. This orange diagonal, well, it is the negative of the 1 diagonal, so let's call it negative 1. This yellow one is negative 2, and so on. And now, finally, we can, for integers n and m, define n minus m as exactly n plus negative m. This works for all integers, and you can show that, for example, n minus n is always the 0 integer. Now you may rightfully ask what did we have to do all that quotient nonsense for? Couldn't we have just added the negative numbers, called it a day and ended up with the same thing? On the one hand it is true that would also work, but when actually proving these things having to consider case splits whether or not an integer is negative every time you encounter one is rather annoying. The quotient way is more uniform. And more importantly it generalizes better. Consider this. We can add, multiply, and subtract integers, but division is still not always possible, so let's try and use the exact same trick once again. 
for pairs of integers, this time actually the second isn't allowed to be zero, let AB be equivalent to CD according to tilde Q if A times D equals B times C. As an example, pairs that are equivalent to 2, 1 include 4, 2, 6, 3, but also negative 2, negative 1. We can list these pairs in the grid once again. Note that the middle column is empty because B isn't allowed to be 0. The pair is equivalent to 2, 1 lie here, the ones equivalent to 0, 1 here, and if I color the entire thing, whoa, it can be a little hard to see due to the fact that the colors become similar to each other when you go further left or right. Maybe keep that one in mind, but equivalence classes all lie on lines through the center. Here's the equivalence class containing 2, 3, for example. You can also directly see why we can't have 0, 0, as that would be equivalent to absolutely everything, which would ruin our equivalence class structure. Analogous to what we did before, we define the reciprocal of AB to be BA, though this only works if A isn't zero, and AB times CD is A times C, B times D. And, just like before, we can now think about the equivalence classes instead. For example, the reciprocal of the equivalence class containing negative 3, 1 is the one containing 1, negative 3, and if you multiply them together you get this one, containing 1, 1. Also, here's addition and negation, that one's rather straightforward. Addition may seem a little strange, but it really is just what implicitly happens whenever you add fractions. And thus we define the rational numbers as the quotient of pairs of integers where the second one isn't zero by tilde q. We refer to them as p over q, where p and q are the pair in the equivalence class with the smallest positive q. In this case, it's negative 1 over 3. n divided by m is now just n times the reciprocal of m, which we can always take as long as m isn't zero. And n divided by n is always 1, referring to the rational number 1 over 1. Numbers which are something over 1 are just the integers, so we leave out the over 1 part. This means we can add, multiply, subtract, and divide rational numbers. They are pretty great. What's particularly interesting about them is that the distances between them, that is the magnitude of the difference, can get arbitrarily small, meaning we can have interesting sequences. Sequences are infinite lists of rational numbers. Really, they are just functions from natural to rational numbers. And whoa, don't worry about the functions themselves. They are just arbitrary examples. The aspect of sequences we really care about is their limit behavior, whether they approach anything as n approaches infinity. The first two series definitely don't. A just explodes to infinity, and B just oscillates between two values indefinitely. With C, however, if we look at the distances between two consecutive values, you can see that they become smaller and smaller. And what about D? How do we define these things exactly? Take a deep breath and enter epsilon. If for any distance epsilon u throw at me, I can provide a benchmark n north, such that for any numbers n and m above that benchmark, the distance of the sequence evaluated at n and m is smaller than epsilon, then I have proven that the sequence approaches something, that when you go far enough out along the sequence, all distances become arbitrarily small. These sequences are called Cauchy sequences. Now, if I make an even stronger claim that I actually found a specific number x, such that the sequence approaches x, I have to prove the following. For any distance epsilon u throw at me, I can find a benchmark and null, that part is the same such that for any number n above that benchmark, the distance between the sequence evaluated at that point n and my fixed number x is smaller than epsilon. In other words, the sequence gets arbitrarily close to x. If that's the case, we also say the sequence converges. Even without worrying too much about the actual definitions, it's easy to see that the first claim automatically follows from the second. Because of the way distance works, if the values of a sequence approach a specific value, they must also approach each other. What about the other direction? Does every Cauchy sequence converge? Well, when I said before that the functions were arbitrary examples, I lied a little. Consider our fourth sequence, D. It turns out that this is indeed a Cauchy sequence. You can show this, for example, from the fact that it's always increasing but never becomes greater than 2. If you square, or multiply by itself, every element in that sequence, you get a new Cauchy sequence, and it just so happens that that sequence approaches exactly the number 2. You can check the distances according to our definition, and they really do get arbitrarily small. So, if our sequence of squares approaches 2, that must mean that the original sequence d approaches a square root of 2. 
but we know because of that rather famous proof by contradiction that no rational number is the square root of 2, meaning in the rational numbers the Cauchy sequence d does not converge. In fact, if you were to choose an arbitrary Cauchy sequence, it will, in some sense, almost certainly not converge to a rational number. There are simpler sequences than d for which this is easy to show, I just thought the square root of 2 sequence was kinda neat. Can we extend our numbers once more such that every Cauchy sequence converges? It's time to use the quotient trick one more time. If a and b are rational Cauchy sequences, then let them be equivalent according to tilde r if their differences approach zero. There is no need to take the magnitude here, the difference can be negative as long as it eventually approaches zero. And let the real numbers be the quotient of the set of rational Cauchy sequences by this tilde r. Because these equivalence classes of rational Cauchy sequences are so much more real than all this fake nonsense we've been talking about so far. Doing arithmetic with Cauchy sequences is easy, you just operate on their respective values and you can use the epsilon definitions to show that it all stays Cauchy and works out properly. As a quick note, if you have some rational number s, repeating it over and over will trivially be a Cauchy sequence, and the equivalence class containing that sequence is the real number corresponding to the rational number s. We know that, by definition, in the real numbers, any rational Cauchy sequence converges. But what about real Cauchy sequences? A real sequence is just an infinite list of real numbers. If we expand each real numbers into one of the Cauchy sequences it contains, we can write them out in a grid like this, where each column, q0, q1, etc. represents one of those Cauchy sequences. If a real sequence was also Cauchy, then that means that the values get closer together both downwards and rightwards. This means that the diagonal is also a Cauchy sequence and, in fact, its equivalence class is exactly the real number our original real Cauchy sequence approaches. This means that in the real numbers all Cauchy sequences converge. This is also referred to as completeness, which is great because it lets you do all of calculus. Also the real numbers are uncountable, but that's a story for another day. Of course, there is no reason to stop here. The complex numbers are pairs of real numbers with these definitions for addition and multiplication, which just happen to have a lot of particularly nice properties, including giving negative 1 a square root. The quaternions do the same with quadruples, then there's the piadics, which are like a strange family of cousins to the reals, and this all barely scratches the surface, but that's not really what's important here. What is important is that I hope I could give you some insight on what numbers really are, or rather how they can be defined. It's true that we made some arbitrary choices along the way, but ultimately when someone talks about, I don't know, pi, the real number pi, what they're really talking about is something like an equivalence class of Cauchy sequences of rational numbers, which are themselves equivalence classes of pairs of integers, which in turn are equivalence classes of pairs of natural numbers which are sets inductively generated by a successor function starting at zero, the empty set, the set of nothing. Thank you for watching.